Well, welcome. It's such a pleasure to see so many people come to see Dr. Ortiz speak. Um, before I introduce Dr. Ortiz, I'd like to call your attention to two wonderful exhibits that we have going on right now in special collections. Um, the first one is up in the gallery on the second floor, and it's commemorating the 50th anniver 500th anniversary sorry, Jim, of the naming of Florida. And it'll be open through March, so if you get a chance, walk up the stairs and take a look at that. The other exhibit um, is celebrating the lives and works of a local group of black female social activists, the Visionaires. I don't know if you're familiar with that group. And the exhibit's almost pulled together. Um, you can be found in the main reading room on the second floor as well. Let's turn to our wonderful speaker here, Paul Ortiz. Most of you probably know that he's the um, director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, and he's associate professor of history at the University of Florida. He earned his PhD in history at Duke University in the year 2000. Well, besides the book Paul's gonna talk about today, one of my favorites, Emancipation Betrayed, He's the co-author of Remembering Jim Crow, African Americans Talk About Life in the J Jim Crow South. And he received numerous awards um, for these, this book that he co-authored. He was also presented with the key to the city of Ocoee, Florida, for his 2010 address at the city's annual Martin Luther King Jr. Unity Parade and Celebration. And this was on the topic of the 90th anniversary of the Ocoee Massacre of 1920. So I hope that's a little tease. You might go out and start Googling that and see what you can read about that. Those of you that know Paul know that he's more than a scholar. He's a soldier and a social activist. He's a veteran of the US Army, served as a paratrooper and combat radio operator with the 82nd Airborne Division. He attained the rank of Sergeant E5. He was also awarded a Humanitarian Service Award for his work in Colombia in the wake of the Novado del Ruiz volcanic disaster in Tolima. But here at, Paul, he teaches here at UF, Paul teaches courses in African American history and is the faculty advisor for the Student Farm Worker Alliance and the Venezuelan Student Association. One major oral history project that's close to my heart that he directs, the Mississippi Delta Freedom Project, brings teams of lucky students to this region that figured centrally in the civil rights movement. Students interview and speak with um, community elders who lived through Jim Crow and the movement, gaining a better understanding of the harsh realities of desegregation and voter registration in Mississippi. And through this interactions with these historic figures and places, have, it's inspired so many students. Well, Paul's a busy guy. He's also working on three other books, Behind the Veil, African Americans in the Age of Segregation, 1865 to 1965. Another book, Our Separate Struggles Are Really One, African-American and Latina, Latino Histories, and The Dissonant Large, The Memoirs of Stetson Kennedy, which should prove to be very wonderful. Let's turn back to the book that we've all come to hear Paul speak about, Emancipation Betrayed. Paul? Thank you, Jana, for such a kind introduction. It's such an honor to to be here in the library and to be asked to participate in this wonderful series. Um, it's, it's such a, a pleasant uh, feeling, too, to be among so many friends, uh, both uh, here at the university and the broader community, activists, historians, uh, scholars, people who care deeply about history. Uh, Florida has an epic history along many lines. Uh, environmental history, indigenous Native American history, African American history, political, civil war. I mean, so many aspects of the state are just so remarkable. And kind of the ramp up to, to the 500th, um, I would encourage us all to think about what this means, you know, what these anniversaries mean to us, what we can do with them. Uh, we used to joke that, that Black History Month was the shortest month of the year, right? And um, that was until we were able, many people struggled and, and fought the good fight and came together to make Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Day a holiday. Now, in practical terms, Black History Month really begins in the lead up to MLK Day and now it runs to the end of February. So now we can say Black History Month is the longest month of the year in some ways. Uh, because I have so many colleagues in, in special collections here, I thought I would bring some ephemera that's a term for it. And Jana mentioned um, my work in Ocoee, and I'm just going to pass this Ocoee button around. I'm not going to say anything about it, but just take a look at it, because Ocoee, Florida, is going to come into the talk. And 
Not to put her on, her, on the spot, she's not here. She actually is an Echoian. Uh, and I, I've shared some of these stories with her. Um, I want to start actually by thanking people. When I think about the process of writing Emancipation Betrayed, and why don't I just, I'll just pass this around if you. The process of writing a book, any book, uh, is, a, is a collective labor. And this book would not be in existence uh, if it weren't for the collective labor's guidance and advice of so many people. Um, one of the gentlemen is sitting directly opposite of me, Jim Cusick. Uh, when I came to the University of Florida uh, as a anonymous graduate student, I think the first time in 1996, uh, Jim Cusick sat down with me and he said, we're gonna do whatever it takes to find the material that you really need to find. And Jim sat with me. We went through box after box, governor's papers, maps, uh, census records, old newspapers. Uh, and so I really owe a great debt of gratitude to Jim Cusick. And I, I want to acknowledge it. And then to all of the special collections and library staff. And, and wherever I go in the United States and abroad, I tell people, we have the best library and special collection staff in the world right here. Uh, and it's such an amazing uh, uh, treat and, and honor and, and such a great thing to be able to work with such great colleagues. Um, the other person I really want to acknowledge who from the very beginning, what for me has been a great guiding hand and a mentor, um, is David Colburn. Uh, my dissertation advisor, when I was first on my way down to Florida to do this research in, in the late 90s, um, Bill Chafe said the first person you need to talk to is David Colburn. And again, David uh, didn't know me from Adam. You know, I was a young graduate student. David was already on his way to becoming provost of the university, and he sat down with me. He took hours of time with me to talk with me about my project, and most of all, he was enthusiastic, and he maintained that enthusiasm about, about the book. So I have so many debts um, that I will never really build a pay except to kind of try to pay them forward in the writing of the book. I wanted to start by showing you a slide, a couple slides. W.S. Stevens is a key character in the, the black freedom struggle in Florida. If you've read Emancipation Betrayed, you already kind of know um, about him. And I had the opportunity to do some oral history work with his uh, family members. He passed away in the 1940s, but he was at the leading edge of what I call the Florida movement in the period of World War I up to the election of 1920. W.S. Stevens was out there trying to register people to vote, helping people pay their poll taxes, encouraging people, encouraging African Americans to go to the polls and to try to vote that fateful election day of 1920. This was a moment in history when African Americans in, in the state of Florida, and not just Florida, but other parts of the South, felt that this may be our time to overturn the Jim Crow system of white supremacy. And this is why they took this enormous risk to, to, to show up and to try to vote. They didn't do this because they thought it was the right thing to do or it was the just thing to do, although they knew those things were true as well. They thought that this was a chance to break through the, the system, to knock down the system of segregation. Uh, W.S. Stevens was, as I said, was at the leaning edge of that struggle in, in 1918, 1919, 1920. And when I started doing my research, I found um, uh, the Department of State had just uh, finished this project where they were trying to tell the story of certain key, as they call them, great Floridians. I mean, obviously, W.S. Stevens was a great Floridian. Um, but this was the state version of his story. He was one of the few African Americans who was profiled as part of this initiative. And when I sat down and started interviewing his family members, his daughters, people who knew him, uh, cousins, uh, people who had grown up going to his, his pharmacy, uh, uh, maybe had taken classes with his daughters in school, when I started doing oral histories, I realized there was a lot missing in this story. If, if you look at this, you see the story of a very successful African-American man who uh, is, a, is an entrepreneur, is a successful doctor. Um, that's really about it. You don't get much detail about him until you start talking to family members. One of the, um, 
mysteries when I started doing research on him was that the state documents kept on referring to a two-story hospital that he had built and that had served African Americans in, in, in Western Florida, but I could never find the place. And I thought, if there had been such a, a, a two-story black hospital in the Panhandle of Florida, it should be someplace, right? And, and, and I couldn't find it. Um, so I started doing oral histories. And Emancipation Betrayed really begins in this set of oral histories. And what I discovered was that the story of W.S. Stevens, you know, kind of before and after, was much more complicated than the story that the state wanted to present about him. Uh, he had been a person who, uh, even before he was born, his life was marked by racial violence. Uh, family members have been assassinated, mysteriously killed uh, during the final years of Reconstruction. Uh, Reconstruction was very bloody uh, in, in Florida. Um, he had, in fact, opened a hospital, but it had been bombed and destroyed by the white medical establishment in Gadsden County because they didn't want to compete with a black hospital. It was okay for him to be a black doctor and to, to serve plantation owners and, and take care of, of, of tobacco plantation workers, but owning a hospital is too much. And so the establishment was destroyed. I went back and, just, and found this, th this had occurred right after the election of 1920. That's why there was no building. But it was, it was the oral histories that allowed me to get to this much richer uh, detail. Um, what W.S. Stevens had to deal with on election day was really bad. Um, but I think in some ways what he had to deal with in subsequent years, what his family had to deal with was in some ways even worse. Um, his daughters actually had to finally move out of, uh, uh, of Quincy because they were frequently targeted. Uh, Inez Stevens, who I interviewed, and when we were doing the interview, uh, this was you know, part of the, the experience of doing the book, she broke down into tears, we were crying, she talked about how these guys would just drive by the house and shoot into it. Uh, her father's house. Uh, her father later uh, contracted a kind of paralysis. And she said, they, it, it always seemed like the white folks were trying to take revenge on us for what my father had tried to do in the 1920 election. So finally, the family had to move. And when I in, did the interview work, they were living in Tallahassee, uh, which is about 20 miles east of, of, um, of Quincy. So oral history really was the foundation of the beginning of, of this story. Um, there were a lot of, there have been a lot of personal benefits to me uh, in terms of writing this, and I wanted to share those with you as well because uh, the book has been out for, for a few years, and it has brought me into contact with so many wonderful people. Um, the story in this photograph is um, one day I was giving a talk at a conference on civil rights history in Mississippi. I got a phone call in the, almost the moment the conference had ended. And uh, it was actually um, a veteran civil rights activist handed me her phone, and I, she said, someone wants to speak to you. So I, I said, you know, picked up the phone. I, I didn't know who it was. And uh, the voice on the other end of the phone said, uh, Paul, you probably don't know me. Uh, my name is Lawrence Guion. I said, yes, sir, I know you very well. You're the founding chair of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, uh, an alleged in the civil rights movement. And, and the first thing he said, which was so kind, was he said, I just finished reading your book. And I want to tell you, it's one of the finest books I've ever read in organizing. And it's, I'm going to make it required reading for civil rights movement veterans. And that's how Lawrence Giot operated, great organizer. What he would do is your first conversation, he would give you major props. You know, major, wow, you're great, you're wonderful. And then the ask uh, comes, comes later. But the ask was, was it a tremendous, uh, again, a tremendous uh, benefit to us here at the University of Florida. The ask was, uh, Paul, I want to hang out with your students next year when they come to Mississippi. Uh, is that possible? <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, and so Lawrence Guiot did this amazing organizing workshop with the University of Florida undergraduates and graduate students, two hours that you have with a person who was a key architect 
of the black freedom struggle in Mississippi and a key architect of the Civil Rights Act on the ground, a, a key uh, kind of philosophical legal force behind uh, Section 5 of the Civil Rights Act, that, that pesky little section that so many of our friends in, in high places of power are trying to, to kind of excise, right? So you hear, in the picture here, it's Lawrence Guiot in the center, Margaret Block, who was in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee also in Bolivar County, and Margaret Kibbe, who's holding the book. Uh, I had just interviewed uh, Mr. Guiot about his work. This was during the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. Um, the book has put me in contact and, and, and put us in contact with so many incredible people. When I first started doing oral histories, um, I had planned to actually do, write my dissertation on CORE in Florida uh, during the 1960s. CORE was like the, the SNCC of Florida. It was, it was the young, idealistic uh, college students who were out to change the world. They, they made major advances in counties, the tough counties, like Gadsden County, like Jefferson, like Leon County. Uh, Patricia Stevens Dew was a legend in that movement. We, we all know Dan Harmeling. To Nana Reeve Dew, one of the Dew daughters, John Dew, the great civil rights uh, labor lawyer, Patricia's husband. But getting to know them uh, through the writing of Emancipation of Trade, and then we're able to bring them here. And some of you were there that amazing evening, uh, the spring of 2010, evening with the Dews. And, and you remember what a special night it was to be there with Patricia and John. Um, and of course, they, uh, Patricia has since passed away. And I, I, I wanted to us to think about the fact that the last major um, address that Patricia Stevens do made in her life uh, in public was right here. And she felt it was very important to be here with us at the university uh, because of people like Dan Harmelin, you know, who was a lifelong you know, fellow uh, freedom uh, fighters. Other people, the, the writing Emancipation Betrayed put me in contact, contact with, of course, is Stetson Kennedy and Sandra Parks. Stetson, I, I, my first contact with Stetson was actually when I was working as a grad student. We were doing this project behind the veil, documenting African American life in the Jim Crow South. And it was in the fall of 1993. And Stetson called me, and, and he said, um, and I was in my office. The Behind the Bill project was an oral history project where we were interviewing African American elders all throughout the South, people who come of age during segregation. And we wanted to get their firsthand stories about what segregation had been like, what it was like to grow up in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s, and so on and so forth. And at the very beginning of the project, we get this call from Stetson Kennedy. Now, I just read Southern Exposure. And I was already in awe of this man. And so I pick up the phone. He goes, hello, this is Stetson Kennedy. Uh, in my office at Duke University, I'm like, hello, sir. How are you doing? It's great to hear from you. And, and you know what he told me? He said, you know, I heard about your project. I'm really excited about it. Um, you know, back in the 30s, uh, I, you know, uh, I went around with a young lady by the name of Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, we did much the same work that you all are, are talking about doing now, I just want to make sure one thing at the outset. You have African Americans working on this project. Don't do it like a lot of universities where you only send out white folks to interview African Americans. He said, you've got to be integrated and you've got to be multiracial. It's very important. He said, we learned that in the 1930s in the WPA project. He said, the he took great pride in the fact that the Florida project was much more highly uh, and they're, they're still obviously segregated, but, but it, it, you compare it to the Georgia project or other state projects, there was much more uh, integration, uh, so to speak. This is a picture with Stetson. Um, we interviewed him. Deborah Hendricks is not in the photo. She's our wonderful videographer at the, the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Um, we went out there in the spring of 2011 and it was just a great experience. I remember asking Stetson, you know, I said, Stetson, why have you got your career been so far out in front of, of us historians and sociologists on these issues of like race and class and things like that? And Stetson was, was, could be very fiery, 
you know, in his writing, he was fearless, great public speaker. He railed against oppression and everything like that. But when he got with them one-to-one, -one, he was a very kind person. And um, when I asked him this question about why have you been so out front, because essentially the way I read the development of modern U.S. history is in many ways it's Stetson Kennedy leading the way and uh, the historian's kind of five or ten years behind him, we kind of catch up. And so PBS did that wonderful, amazing breakthrough documentary of modern day slavery uh, last spring and it opened so many eyes, it had such a huge impact, this idea that slavery had endured in white nationalism and in states like Florida, Mississippi, and Alabama, North Carolina, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of African Americans have been caught in this system of modern day slavery. Uh, it was a great breakthrough, but Stetson, that's Southern exposure, 1946. I mean, that's Stetson in 1952 going before the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, talking about forced labor in the United States. So emancipation of trade put me in contact with Stetson, and I'll always be grateful. The exciting thing, too, and, and Flo can, can uh, give more detail on this, is we've been working to, is it okay for me to announce this? The, the, the balance of the Stetson Kennedy papers are coming to the University of Florida. And it is such an exciting thing because Stet the way I see this, this is going to sound romantic. Stetson and Zora, Neil Hurston, together again. Think about this, dirt roads, traveling down dirt roads in the 1930s together, and now together in the library. And what a great resource for us, for us here. This, of course, is a photograph that was that that Stetson had placed on um, as as an inset to Jim Crow Guide. Now, the book Jim Crow Guide was published uh, not in the United States initially, but it was published in France. The line editor for the book, by the way, was Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, those of you who are familiar with her work uh, in philosophy and, and feminist theory, um, the picture is taken in South Florida. And I wanted to show a couple of photographic images of segregation and Jim Crow and how it was unique and distinctive in, in places like Florida uh, or even places like uh, Texas. This is a Jim Crow sign from Texas. I grew up, uh, the reason I was drawn to this topic was I had grown up hearing stories uh, that my father and uncles told about Jim Crow in Texas up in Houston, and this was a sign, the Lone Star Restaurant Association, that they saw every day. My father worked as a, a busboy. Uh, young Hispanic men were never hired as waiters uh, in those days. It was always a busboy. I mean, in fact, a busboy was like the top of the line. Uh, usually you were a dishwasher um, or a cook. At least as a busboy, you had the chance maybe of sharing, you know, if, if, if the waiters or waitresses were kind enough, they may share tips with you. Um, so I grew up hearing these, these stories about segregation, and that is one of the things that really, I think, kind of drew me to, to the work. One of the joys in, in, in writing Emancipation from Trade was meeting so many incredible people. And I want to talk about Laura Dixie, uh, Sam Dixie, and A.I. Dixie. AI and Sam Dixie really essentially gave me my dissertation and hence gave me the book. And, and how they gave it to me was I sat down and did an interview with them in the summer of 1994. Now to understand um, the summer of 1994, you have to, we have to kind of go back in time. The summer of 1994, when I first came to Florida as part of the Behind the Veil Oral History Project, it was just right after the Rosewood Compensation Hearings. And I want us to think about this for a, a moment. You could read a newspaper in Orlando or Miami, and even if people had not listened to the compensation hearings in Tallahassee, they were writing about them. Uh, it was an electric atmosphere. Uh, a group of African-American elders had come together and were giving testimony in public for the first time about the Rosewood Pogrom, the Rosewood Massacre. And to be in this state and to be a young historian in 1994 was a remarkable experience because people began to say, we need to tell these stories. We need to talk about what has happened 
in Florida, both good and bad. We need to start talking about Roseville. I mean, one of the great things that our students in the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program are doing now is they're getting more documentation on these events, uh, like a Coe, uh, like Rosewood, but also l lesser known things. The Perry Civil War in 1922. It's not in my book because I didn't have enough information about it. But now we're doing oral history work and documenting uh, incidents of, of racial violence in places like Perry, right? Um, but Sam and A.I. Dixie, of course, were brothers. And I sat down and did this interview with them in 1994. And they, they took me into rural Gadsden County in the 1920s and 1930s. And they told me, they talked to me about what it meant to be a sharecropper, what it meant to be a tenant farmer, what it meant to be a small holder, and what it meant to uh, not be allowed to plant shade tobacco, because that was the cash crop. And only the white farmers were allowed to plant shade tobacco. And in the book, I have, there's an interview with Malachi Andrews, uh, an incredible man who was also a farmer. And I asked him during the course of our interview uh, what would happen if an African-American farmer tried to plant shade in the 1920s. And his response was so chilling to me and powerful. You have to visualize an incredibly uh, religious man. You, you, the moment you walk into his house, he's in his mid-80s, there's you know, Christian iconography everywhere. And the landscape that he described for me in, 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 in Florida in the 1920s, I, the only way I can describe it was an Old Testament uh, environment. It was, he said, if you try to grow shade tobacco, the Klan would come for you first. They would, would burn down your crops, they would burn down your house, they would, they would shoot you or, or, or torture you in some way, you had to leave. Uh, he said that's how they kept us uh, in, in our place. When I interviewed A.I. and Sam Dixie, these, these two brothers, they told me this story about how, this, you know, back in 1920, a group of people in this lodge, and I, I, it took me a while, to, I was kind of slow in the uptake. They, they said this, this group called the Knights of Pythias. I've never heard of this group. You know, I was studying African American history, but they said, you gotta understand the Knights of Pythias. They took this oath, they took this pledge, to stick together, and then this army of Klansmen came descending into western uh, Gadsden County and, and came, and there's this enormous gun battle that took place. Um, and I said, why did this gun battle take place? Right. And he said, because these men had taken a pledge to, to stick together and the Klan had heard about this pledge and came out, and then the gun battle occurred. So this, this huge cataclysm had occurred in Western Orange County. When I first heard the story, it took me a while to process, and then I started doing research on it, and I was really almost ready to give up on, on what had been the source of this pledge um, until I started reading, uh, I, I remember going into the W.E. Uh, du Bois papers uh, for the Library of Congress, and realizing the pledge that they had taken in 1920 was a pledge to register and vote and pay their poll taxes in this lodge, which at that time contained about one out of every five African American men in the state of Florida. And if you didn't pay your poll taxes and register to vote uh, after a period of six months, you would be asked to leave the lodge. You would be expelled. And what this meant was that you would lose your burial benefits, your widow or widower would use would lose their death benefits because you paid a, a kind of a, a union dues into the lodge. And so lodge membership for African Americans during this time, it was a lifeline. It wasn't just, oh, I'm a member of this organization. It was your salvation. And when I talked to A.I. Dixie, I said, what did it mean to be a member of the Knights of Pythias when you were, when you were growing up? And he said, you know, and, and A.I. Dixie told what I would I've learned to call mule stories uh, because he grew up around mules and having to depend upon mules for his livelihood when he wanted to tell you a story or teach you a lesson he used a mule as a metaphor right and so he would say what the Knights of Pythias meant to a poor sharecropper was if you had a mule and your mule was sick and couldn't pull your plow your brother in the Knights of Pythias was required by your by your covenant of your lodge to come out and bring his mule and, and help you finish your harvest or, 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 or 
you know, maybe finish chopping cotton or, or doing some other chore. If you were sick, your brother or sister was bound by your oath to come over and help you out, to, to, to feed you, to help clothe you, get your kids to, to school, whatever the case may be. So lodge membership was so key. And that's why this pledge that the Knights of the Pythias had taken to register to vote had so much meaning. It wasn't an outside organizer coming in and saying, hey, you should register to vote. It's, it's the right thing to do. We want to get a certain you know, set of policies put in place. It was your lodge brother or sister saying, um, you got to do it. And coming out of World War I, so many African Americans in the state of Florida, in fact, John O. Franklin did some research on this. I really benefited by being a grad student at Duke when John Franklin was. Um, one day, I ran into Dr. Franklin, and he knew I was working on Florida history. He said, young man, I know you're working on that Florida topic. He said, I came, came across a piece of research. Do you know that the black male participation in World War I was much higher than the white male participation in World War I? And he had this table, and he just handed it to me. I was like, wow, thank you, Dr. Franklin. I really appreciate that. So a large number of African-American men served in, in France and fought in combat units and came back to Florida in, in 1918, 1919. They want citizenship. They have fought in this war for democracy. So a lot of things are coming together to, to make this voter registration campaign. But one of the joys of, of doing this was to, to in, in recent years, put our University of Florida students in contact with some of these amazing people. And so Laura Dixie really was the person who was at the heart of my early dissertation work. Laura was uh, is, is Sam's husband. Sam has passed away. Um, but the Dixies took me into their house in, in the summer of 1994. And the reason was this. I was, I was staying in a hotel doing oral histories. Was, you know, and uh, Laura Dixie called me one day. She was a retired hospital worker, had founded the AFSCME local, uh, union local in Tallahassee. And she said, Paul, we, uh, I talked with my husband and some members of the community. You've been asking a lot of questions about the Ku Klux Klan and the racial violence. Um, you don't want to be concerned about your safety. Concerned about your safety. There's been some murmurings in Tallahassee. So now I don't know if I was ever in physical danger, but the Dixies, the point, the reason I'm telling you this story is they took me in. They, they literally adopted me and said, we want to make sure that you're safe. Uh, and so from that time on, when I went to Tallahassee to do research, I would stay with um, Laura and Sam Dixie. And last year, I was able to bring a group of University of Florida students um, to, to meet with uh, Laura Dixie. Laura Dixie is, what was, is one of the last uh, living, surviving key organizers of the Tallahassee bus boycott. And it was such a, a rare treat to be able to spend time with her. These are some photographs. Of her. This is Laura Dixie right here. She is a, a tremendous storyteller. We're inside of her house. Uh, she opens up her house to us uh, every fall. When we drive to Mississippi, this is a great stop for us to make because we have a chance to sit down and talk with one of the organizers of, of the Tallahassee bus uh, boycott. Some of our students, you'll, you'll recognize a few. I won't call them out, uh, but it was just so cool. We had, in, in this last year, uh, Sam Jr. Uh, uh, did a fish fry uh, for us, and so we had a lot of good uh, fringe benefit of oral history, by the way. You get a lot of uh, free meals if you enter. That, that's a picture of Sam Jr. When Sam Sr. passed away in 2005, um, I was actually giving a talk on the book at the University of Illinois, and um, Sam called me, uh, Sam Jr., and said, you know, my father passed away. Um, it would really mean a lot to us if you would write um, his second eulogy. Uh, and we were going to deliver this at Bethel Baptist in Tallahassee, and, and, and I did that. Um, it, it was such a, you know, it's such an incredible experience to do oral history and to be able to stay in contact with people that you interviewed, but at the same time, you know, there's sadness because all of the people that I interviewed for this book, except for Laura Dixie, have passed away. They were already in their early mid 80s. Uh, AI Dixie was 91. But our first, the first book reading event I ever did with this book, by the way, was was in their house. 
Uh, it was in 05, right after the book came out. The house was packed. Uh, we began by, hey, I did some telling some mule stories. Uh, and then at a certain point, you know, his, his nephews and nieces are like, okay, Uncle AI, that's, thank you for your stories. Now we want to hear what the, the young man has to say. Uh, it was just a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. Some of the food um, that we enjoyed last fall, the, university, the very hungry University of Florida, two vans on our way to, to the Mississippi Delta is very, very appreciated. Um, one of the, uh, is kind of moved towards a, a kind of wrapping up. One of the great benefits of, of writing a book is, um, well, doing what we're doing now. With wonderful people. Um, I was called a few years ago by, I don't know if anyone listens or watches the History Detectives. Um, it's a really fun program. And I got to be on History Detectives. These are these, these folks that go around and, and they find a question and, and they do research on it. And it's always intriguing, it's always exciting. So this question really went to the heart of Emancipation Betrayed. And, and the question was, why would African Americans want to leave the state of Florida during Reconstruction and think about going to Africa? So I got a call one day, they asked me this question. What, he said, you should have the great state of Florida. Yes. I can give you an earful of that information. Um, that special, by the way, they, they do it usually in three segments together, right? So the other segment that evening was the mystery of Mussolini's dagger, right? And, and this, this young man. But being on the program really, again, got me to the heart of why what we do here as historians and librarians and, and special collections staff um, and community historians is so very important. Um, people want to know this history and they need to know these stories. They need to hear from people like Laura Dixon, Sam Dixie, A.I. Dixie. And the Akoe part of, of the story for me is one of the most uh, both troubling and inspiring parts of, of the odyssey uh, that I have been able to take as a researcher. I passed around the little Okoe button, and um, I got that recently from a couple of friends in Okoe. Um, but one night about, was it three years ago? Um, actually, it's, it's four years now. Someone called me, and it was 12.30 at night. And, and they called me, and they said, um, Paul, oh, I represent a group of, of people, the Human Relations Commission in, in Ocoee, and we'd like to invite you down to give our MLK keynote. My initial response was, I was like, is this a crank call? Um, I had been in Ocoee about eight or nine years earlier and had made a quick exit um, for a number of complicated reasons I won't get into at this point. Uh, but now the city was asking me to come down and, and, and talk on the 90th anniversary of the occasion of the Ocoee pogrom and, 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 and massacre. Now, the chance to do this, to be with the people in Ocoee, was such an incredible experience. And I wrote about this on a piece for Facing South. And, and what I felt I was doing was we had incredible conversations with the mayor, you know, the, the, the chief of. Um, first African-American sheriff um, in the history of Orange County, Jerry Demick, five physical, intellectual presence. And just to be in a Coe for the, and first of all, I was like, MLK and a Coe? I mean, it took me a little while as a historian to kind of put my head around this. You know, historians were much better at thinking about the past sometimes than the present. happening in Okoye was that newer generations of people were moving into, into this town, and the small town that I conceptualized as a historian in 1920 was now actually a booming kind of suburb of, of, of Orlando. Now, they don't like you to say that, but it, that's kind of how I look at it. 
Oh, totally agree with that. So a lot of young professionals were going out there, and they wanted to know. They had heard about this story, this massacre, but no one really wanted to talk about it. And so there had been this debate about bringing this guy from the University of Florida who wrote this book, uh, very mixed reception in the community, obviously. Um, they said, let's just bring him out because so many people are talking and debating, and it's better to finally get this out in the open and to talk about it uh, than to keep it under wraps because we want to bring people to the, to, to, to the city. We can't bring them to the city if they're going to be concerned about the same bomb that occurred. And, and there's this. So, three days ago, in 2010, they gave me this very nice plaque. I remember. about the term massacre. We didn't have a massacre in Chloe. So Sheila, um, you know, maybe guess how the trajectory of the argument went. But people were incredibly welcoming, uh, incredibly gracious, and had been trying and continue to try to get this out, to talk about this. It, it's kind of a halting effort, but, but it's an enduring effort because you have so many people who are saying we're not going to continue to try to cover it up. And to me, that's very inspiring. Um, in the fall of 2012, I was also really just incredibly humbled uh, to receive this photograph. And July Perry, who had been a leader of the voter registration efforts in Western Orange County in 1920, uh, of course, was was assassinated. Um, for decades, his grave was unmarked. People knew where he was buried, but they were terrified of putting a decent marker uh, over the man's grave because they were worried about retaliation or, or vent, revenge. And finally, I think in, I believe it was around 2005 when a, when a proper marker was was um, was built was, was established. Uh, last fall, uh, there was a conference on the history of, of race uh, in, in Florida. And uh, my dear friend, Tricia Hilliard Nunn, sent me this, this photograph. And she said, you know, someone placed a copy of Emancipation Trade on the marker for Mr. Perry. And I was, you know, just, we started crying about it. And it's just, um, these are freedom fighters who lived here, who died here, who, who fought to make this, this place a better, a, a better state. The worst thing I, that I think we can do is to, is to forget that, forget the fact that they, they made these sacrifices. Joy Perry, to me, uh, is, 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 is really a, a, a hero. Uh, someone every school children, every school child in the state of Florida should know who he is, uh, who he was, what he tried to, to accomplish. Kind of wrapping up now, um, uh, Janet asked me to talk about some of my forthcoming uh, work. Um, I'm actually, I just finished an essay. Uh, Professor uh, Zeger was kind enough to talk to me about this uh, periodically. Um, I don't think, I, I kind of, it was an enforced audience because he, he was driving me to the Labor Council meetings. Uh, and so I had to, I had him a captive audience. But I just finished an essay on William Watson Davis, uh, who wrote a book called Civil War and Reconstruction in Florida. We talk about the 500th anniversary, the 450th anniversary. Great kind of state commission, and they picked 12 books. Years, and one of the books, of course, was William Watson Davis's book, Civil War and Reconstruction in Florida. And so I, I wrote this essay on Dr. Davis. Um, he was a professor. Uh, actually, interestingly enough, he taught at Lawrence, Kansas, you know, University of Kansas. But he wrote this book. Um, to really, in many ways, uphold the status quo in the state of Florida. Uh, he published the book in 1913. It was a book that really kind of vindicated um, uh, redemption, uh, white violence. He actually did oral history work, but he only interviewed white people, uh, some of whom had participated in, in, in massacres. And it's right there in his footnotes. So that book is coming out um, 
University of Kentucky Press. Um, I have an article in it, and we were the, the chapter authors were asked to write um, essays about our particular state. And so I wrote Florida uh, essays on, on, on most of the other southern states as well. Um, very interesting experience to write that that essay about Davis. It's such a key figure in, in Florida's historiography. This is one of my favorite photographs of all time. Um, and this, I think, may be the cover for our separate struggles, or really one. Um, Professor Zeger will be familiar with this, the, the context for this photo. Uh, these are a group of women who are on strike. Uh, this is the, the we call the, the Frontier uh, Hotel strike uh, of the 1990s. It was this kind of epic six and a half year long strike. It involved 50, 550 workers in the Vegas Strip. Um, not a single one crossed the picket line. The leadership was, by this time, primarily African American, Latinas, Asian American women, a lot of whom were single mothers. Uh, and they were building the fastest growing union in the United States of America. Uh, the Culinary Workers, Local 2, uh, 226. And that story is kind of a bookend uh, for my book. I kind of, you know, historians always have a hard time ending. Like, like right now, I'm having a hard time ending. Where, how, do we, how can I stop, right? Um, but in some ways, the building of that union is, is kind of the, the, the ending of, of this story, which is trying to put African-American and Latino historical narratives in conversation with each other. And when you build a union local of 60,000 members, and they're active, and they're engaged, and they're energetic, you do amazing things. You bring the President of the United States to Las Vegas in 2013, and he gives a major policy speech on, on immigration. But the reason that President Obama went to Las Vegas is it's a union town. These are immigrant women, African American women, working class white women, and they are on the march. They have, they have really uh, changed the course of, of modern U.S. history. When the Culinary Union Local 226 threw its support behind, President Obama, or behind Senator Obama in 08, within a period of days, the Los Angeles Federation switched from Senator Clinton. Uh, within a few days, the, the King County Labor Federation switched to Obama. And it was kind of a ripple effect. But this demonstrates to you where we are as a country how things have changed. I mean, these African-American women and Latino women working together in, in concert and, and in struggle. So that's kind of the later, um, the latter book end of the book. Um, I'll close on this. One of my favorite oral history projects was Harold Priest. I like to think of him as kind of a young uh, Stetson Kennedy flow in, in, in Texas in the 30s and 40s. He went out to interview Mexican-Americans about Mexican Revolution, which had, had occurred in the 1910s. And he started interviewing these guys. I like to think my, my grandfather was that my grandfather was, was a railway man for the, uh, an oiler actually for the uh, Southern Pacific and, uh, in, in Houston. And uh, I like to think he was somewhere in the mix there. But anyway, Harold Priest goes out to interview these men about the Mexican Revolution. He wants to hear their, their stories. He knows many of them. Um, you know, would have been around during the revolution, maybe had fought in the revolution. But when they started talking to him, he realized when they were giving names, he said, I don't know any of these, I've never heard of any of these names. Who is Vicente Guerrero, for example? And then he went to, well, he didn't go to the internet, right? He went to, he went to Jim Cusick, or Jim Cusick's counterpart in 1945 and started doing research. And he realized that the names that these railway men were, were, were sharing with them were not from the Mexican Revolution, they were from the Mexican War of Independence, 1810 to 1821. And here it is, 1945. So these were stories that their, their obviously family and community had passed down over 100 years. And it kind of reminded me of my own dissertation research, because when I went out to, to do this research that eventually became Emancipation Betrayed, I really wanted to work on, like I said, core in the 1960s, or even the Tallahassee bus boycott. But you know, when I started interviewing organizers and activists in those movements, they said, young man, if you, want to if you want to talk to anyone about political struggle, we need to talk to our parents, our grandparents. And you really should have talked to our great-grandparents. Where were you? 
What took you so long? I, often people say, what took you so long to, to, to get out of here? Okay. Um, because they wanted, they, they said, whatever we did in the 50s and 60s, Built on what our elders had done in the 1920s, and then back in, in um, you know, going back to Reconstruction. So, I like to think of myself as part of that oral history tradition of people like Harold Priest. We just go out with questions. We're we're concerned. We we want to learn things. And if you're open to surprises, you know, amazing stories can can unfold. So, thank you for your patience. I'll be happy to take questions. I think that Jan is going to give you the. the um, thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it. And I, a reason I came today, when I'm putting on this little survey, uh, I've been waiting, hoping for someone to clarify the comprehensive picture of a reign of terror in which Rosewood and the aerial bombing of Black Tulsa were just the late highlights, not isolated incidents. And it began at emancipation, but really got its endorsement out of the hayes tilden Compromise of 1876. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Callie. The, um, there's a new book that just came out uh, by Marvin Dunn. And uh, Marvin is an emeritus professor at Florida International. It's titled The Beast in Florida, The History of Anti-Black Violence. And if you want my Journalists are really starting to, to try to put these things together. And I agree with you. I think up until now, we're, we've been really laboring to try to put together narratives of individual cases. You know, like Tulsa, there was the, the Truth Commission, right, in Tulsa. There was the Rosewood Compensation Hearings, which, which um, David Colburn and Larry Rivers, uh, Maxine Jones and others worked so hard to put together. Now I think we're at a point when we, can, we should be able to start knitting these narratives together and really beginning to ask ourselves, what is the totality here? What, what does this mean when you kind of put it, uh, put these narratives together? And you're right. I mean, these are stories rooted in Reconstruction. Um, part of the new wave of Florida history, by the way, um, Dan Winefield, the Jackson County War. Um, this is a uh, Mariana and in Jackson County. Uh, which again was violence on an epic level. This is not just, you know, someone gets shot one day, it's a terrible thing, and then, then that's the end of it. I mean, these are, I mean, these are uh, gun battles that take place all during uh, Reconstruction, uh, and they're protracted. And actually, Reconstruction is really the most violent uh, period of American political history. I mean, we have not been, J. Morgan Couser, and other Southern scholars have been trying to create a database on lynchings and political murders that occurred during Reconstruction. We're talking thousands of people uh, in a 10-year uh, period of time. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a very important um, narrative. Yes? Uh, I don't need that. <laughs> yes, you press your shopping again.
hard, yeah. The Klan ran Gainesville for decades. I mean, we had an event last week about academic freedom and activism, and we retold the story of the abduction, uh, torture, and castration of Father Connolly, uh, taken from, from us, from the University of Florida, and brutalized by the Klan. The Klan was so powerful that President Murphy, who was president of the campus at that time, felt he couldn't even say anything. Um, there are so many stories about the Klan that are just now, I mean, Marvin Dunn has actually, the thing I like about Marvin Dunn's new book, by the way, as it's going around, check out this book, because he interviewed, he didn't, he did this historical research on these, these bloody events, but he went back and he interviewed descendants, uh, both perpetrators and victims. Uh, it's, it's a powerful, very powerful story. When I was sitting with Mayor Scott in this cafe in Ocoee, I think it's called the Ocoee Cafe, as people would come in the door, he'd lean over and he'd say, Paul, that, that person's a Klansman. You know, or that person used to be in the Klan and now he's no longer in the Klan. Or it was, it, it was interesting. And by the Klan, Mike Newton's book, uh, what's the title of that book? It's, um, it's on the Klan in Florida. And Newton argues that the Klan in Florida was really maybe the most powerful paramilitary organization in the United States after Reconstruction. Um, this is where Stetson Kennedy cut his teeth. I mean, Stetson grew up in a Klan family. You know, he saw the, the, the violence um, that they perpetrated on people. He would say, the Klan would go out to supposedly discipline a, a, a man who was publicly drunk, uh, and, and they would go out with this moral uh, mission, but then they would be drunk themselves uh, when they were you know, doing these things. We have an oral history with Sheriff McCall, the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Uh, does that, has anyone ever had a chance to check this out? It's actually digitized. It's online with Sheriff McCall. It's very powerful. It's, it's, it's a short, concise interview where he gives his side of, of, it, of, of certain stories. Um, Sam Proctor made a special point. Uh, I mentioned the Father Connolly case and the Klan. Sam, as you know, um, tried to really, and, and we have to give him a lot of credit for, for, for unearthing these stories. And so there are a lot of great oral histories that we have here that, that speak to some of these incidents. And, and McCall is in there. i tell you a quick anecdote about Willis McCall. When I gave a talk at Florida Southern a few years ago on African American history, the faculty uh, at Florida Southern took me out to eat beforehand. And we were, were at a table, small Cuban restaurant, there's about eight or nine of us. And his name came up. Uh, McCall, that is, and every single faculty member had a story about Willis McCall, uh, and it all involved physical violence. One of the stories was that uh, a young white lawyer had came into the jailhouse one day uh, and said, I need to talk to my client. He, he's incarcerated in, in, your, in your jail. Um, and Sheriff McCall said, no, uh, you're not going to talk. And, and, and the young lawyer made the mistake of saying, well, actually, Sheriff McCall um, this is a constitutional right that your that this person has. Big mistake. He uh, McCall took him out in the back and beat him, um, and that's. But but again, we have a lot of these stories, and and people uh, point out Justin Donovan, who is a, a research um, assistant for the African American History uh, Program initiative at, at the Proctor Program. Uh, Justin and his his peers, graduate students and undergraduates at UF are uncovering a lot of these stories. Uh, they have been to Perry. Uh, they, they're getting interviews about the Perry Civil Wars. Um, they're talking to people like Isaiah Branton, who uh, Mr. Branton is, is sitting there. He's reading as usual, studying, um, who can take us back to turn of the century Gainesville, uh, where you have freedom struggles that, that occur uh, with very deep, uh, deep roots. I, I'm sorry, there was a question over here, too. I don't want to, oh, yeah. 
maybe I didn't hear what you said. Um, you said the Klan ran Gainesville in the 50s? Or did you put a time? Just ran Gainesville, I, I'm not sure, yeah. But I know in the 20s and uh, the, the, the time of the uh, Gainesville aid, and, and yeah, yeah, it was a long-standing. Okay, and then the, the Klan was one of the most powerful military organizations. Yeah. Yeah, in the U.S.? Or in yes. Yeah, Mike Newton says that in his book on the Klan. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, paramilitary. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. Well, in a sense, some of what the gentleman remarks about persists. The Military Religious Freedom Foundation, within the last year, uncovered um, enlisted men in a unit who had uh, Nazi double lightning bolt insignias, SS insignias, that they had created and put on their guns. And there's a linkage historically in the sense that the Klan is the first fascist organization in the world, I would make that argument. And the fascist impulse continues. As unfortunately, we've been hearing from Italy recently, the attempt to revive the, the yeah. Well, and, you know, the flip side of this too, I want to emphasize as well. I mean, and this is an equally important part of, of the story of Florida is, you know, the, the side of, you know, of the black freedom struggle and what we've been finding in the Proctor Oral History Program is, you know, the, the students now are uncovering new generations of African Americans who were, were waging these incredible civil rights, human rights, you know, labor organizing uh, struggles, which we're only barely now beginning to understand um, the importance of. I mean, think about the Tallahassee bus boycott following right on the heels of the Montgomery struggle. And then think of a young student, Patricia Stevens Do. Why does she get engaged in this, in this political struggle at the time that she gets engaged in it? Uh, even to the point of, of facing expulsion from Florida A&M. And why are there so many other young people who decide that they're gonna get involved in, in this political struggle against segregation and white supremacy in, in the 50s and the 60s? And we still don't know the answer to that question. By the way, it's a great dissertation topic. But it, to me, as an organizer, because when I was writing this book, I wrote it both as a historian, but also as a person interested. I come out of the labor movement. How do people organize to change things? How do they change the world? Because Florida, with all of its blemishes and problems and, and, and um, challenges and, and, and ways to go, roads to travel, so on and so forth, um, we have come a long way. The African American freedom struggle, I, the, the civil rights movement has made this state a livable place. Um, because before the civil rights movement, my friends, Florida was like Mississippi before 1945. If you look at the social indicators of the state, if you talk to someone like Governor Bob Graham, life expectancy, health indicators, you go into the rural area. I mean, cities were a little different, but you go into rural areas like the Panhandle, uh, places like Western Orange County, large parts of, of, of South Florida, Lake Okeechobee, currently Broward County area, health and life, child mortality uh, uh, statistics were abysmal. And so a lot of things went into change then. I would argue the biggest thing of all was the Civil Rights Movement. Um, the Civil Rights Movement made the state of Florida, a modern state. And, and then dovetailing the civil rights movement, you had people like Madeleine Lockhart. Uh, you had people like Michael Gannon. You had people like Samuel Proctor. You had people in the University of Florida who were able to at times link with these larger struggles. Then you had a group, a new generation of University of Florida students. Uh, the Harmling brothers. Uh, and, and so many others, again, linked to the Civil Rights Movement. And so the Civil Rights Movement, I would argue, was really a turning point in Florida history, but I'm not sure you would have, I'm not sure any one of us um, 
we wouldn't be in this room in 1944 talking about what we're talking about now. Where am I going with that? I'm not sure. <laughs> but the, move, the black freedom movement was, was the pivot in, in changing this, this state. Um, and, and I'd like us to continue to, to think about that. Other questions? Yeah. A lot of what you were saying concerning uh, uh, the University of Florida A&M and the University of Florida um, was a sense of not having a lot to lose. And the reason for that was that most of us who were associated with these universities knew that we were going to have a career and be able to do better for ourselves. The Harmons were friends of mine. Uh, I was here in Gainesville. The dues uh, I was involved with up in Tallahassee. Uh, and it was common knowledge, you know, we were, we were going to get good jobs someplace at some point, so we were not worried about that. We really wanted to, because we, a lot of us were na native Floridians, a few of us and we had lived in other places where we saw a different life, and we wanted that for our community, for the people here. Uh, this university was a center of a lot of it, also because we wanted the University of Florida to be important. Um, but, uh, you weren't just rambling. You were making some very good points, <laughs> and you were hitting in the very right good. places there. Thank you. I appreciate that. With, with the history, Professor, you never know. You gotta watch it. Don't put us in front of a microphone without giving us a time thing. You know. Other questions? Um, so obviously, um, African American history or the um, the struggles that African Americans have had to live in the state of Florida are um, critical to the to history um, and so I was just curious if you had considering the fact that it's uh, overwhelmingly there's a lot of minorities in the state of Florida yet it up until a couple months ago um, there was a supermajority in the Senate um, I was wondering if there is uh, if what you think the current impediments are for minority and African-American representation politically if there's because obviously the Klan like we don't read about them and I mean Sorry, they are still certainly active, um, but there's not as much um, representation by the Klan um, currently. So I was wondering if where where the shift is. Where the shift is, yeah. Well, I think a big shift, you know, in in thinking about what happened in Las Vegas just a few days ago. Um, if minority, I mean, basically the question you're asking, if I understand this, is how can we continue more demo democratic, small d democratic, where we can all live in freedom and, and justice and equality. And to me, a big piece of that puzzle is, is immigration reform. We have got to, to really decide as a society, not just in Florida, but the entire country, are we going to have 12 million people living in a sort of perpetual Jim Crow without citizenship, without labor rights? Without the right, even without feeling comfortable, even with with going to a PTA meeting, because you're worried about ICD uh, abduction. So immigration reform is is, is pivotal. Um, the kind of coalitions, and, and and one of the jump off points between Emancipation Betrayed and the book I'm finishing now, on African American and Latino narratives, was a story that I just kind of accidentally um, ran into in in Key West. Um, in, in the wake of the Ten Years' War, a lot of veterans, a lot of veteran freedom fighters from Cuba were coming to Key West, Florida. And they were beginning to mix with, with African Americans, politically speaking. Uh, did you know in 1899, the people of Key West elected a judge named Slavery Reparations? 
1890. And this is what people did in Key, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and what happened was you had Bahamian workers, Cuban, uh, Afro-Cubans, Creole, we used to call Creole Cubans, right? We don't use that term much anymore. Um, and, and progressive white folks working together to create a unique, and, and one black journalist went to Key West, T. T Thomas Fortune, Florida, thank you, uh, Jackson County, T. T Thomas Fortune, New York Globe, sent him down, said, find out what on earth is going on in Key West. Something amazing is happening there. And he wrote the L.W. Livingston, who also was just um, wrote this piece called Key West, the freest town in the South. Uh, a remarkable piece, because everywhere else, the South was going up in flames. I mean, Reconstruction was ending. But it was different in Key West. Because of the mix of, of every labor union heard, every labor union meeting. Knights of Labor were very strong there. One speaker in English, one speaker in Spanish. And some other languages also run as well. So as a historian, I love that story because I, I think, wow, that's kind of, Key West looks like the, one of the first towns of the 21st century in some ways. These are people that come from different cultural backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, and they find a way to coalesce politically for a while uh, because eventually we know the end of the story. I mean, eventually Tallahassee Wrangle, invoke the city's charter. They, they put in their puppets from Tallahassee. Uh, uh, James Dean, the judge, is actually uh, disbarred for allegedly performing interracial marriage, which by 1891, of course, was illegal in Florida. Um, that Governor Jeb Bush, one of the great things he, that he did in, during his tenure here was to actually aim to his, uh, he kind of I don't know what the legal term is, but he actually invoked the, the disbarment. Uh, but that was 113 years after the fact. Uh, but, um, but no, that to me that's the key, is people working together politically, uh, immigration reform, um, and, and a lot of these things. I mean, Laura Dixie, if you ask Laura Dixie that question that you just were posing, she would say labor unions are key. That's why she founded, co-founder of the AFSCME Hospital Workers Union in Tallahassee. She said, for those of us who work in the back of the hospital, you know, the dishwashers, the cafeteria workers, the maids, the, 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 the LPNs, uh, the union was our only lifeline to build a middle class um, uh, livelihood you know, for our, 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 our children. Um, and again, you know, that's when I showed the picture from, from Las Vegas, Nevada, 50,000 members of the culinary workers union, I mean, they're not rich folks. Fry cook, their uh, housekeeper. In, in Vegas parlance, they call it back of the house. Isn't that an interesting metaphor? Back of the house. I mean, some people would argue that's where the American working class has been for many decades, in the back of the house. Uh, but yet, through their activism, they move themselves to the forefront. And it's so energetic that President Obama comes out to make his speech. So maybe if we get energetic enough down here, he'll come down here and um, uh, I, this is what I think about the Klan. I think the Klan's changed position uh, through social media, um, through a uh, hidden agenda, and in the black community. Because you can look at the black community, it's still in the 60s, still in the 50s. Base, uh, uh, development. I think the Klan is systematic working. Uh, it's like divide and conquer. You know, you um, and it's due on on the side of the African Americans too because they not going back, uh, putting their potential in there. They're going to the church. And I think it's a hidden agenda that they're reaching for the sky, but they're leaving. And I think that's a part of a systematic clan and, and the media. Uh, 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 it's something to uh, divide and conquer. That's what I think. And I feel like uh, once we look into the real agenda of the clan, you'll understand they took the mask off and they 
began to work the agenda. You know, like the White Citizens Council and Mississippi, um, I mean, we have groups of, you know, at the Academic Freedom uh, panel last week, the question came up, um, where is student activism now? And we have this great group on campus called the Dream Defenders. They just held a public meeting last night at the Latchua County Library. And I don't know what the turnout was, but they, they on their way out, they're so excited. These are students who, some of them actually went to the organizing workshop in Lawrence Gulak. And, uh, and when they got back to Florida, they were ready to go. And so the first issue that they worked on was, of course, you know, the murder of Trayvon Martin, trying to get justice for that. And then they, the, the, the issue they're working on now is uh, incarceration of juveniles in Florida prisons. And I didn't realize this until they started coming back with these statistics. And, and for, they, they, were coming, they came back from Polk County one time last summer, and I met with a, a group of the students, and they said, you know that there are eight-year-old boys in adult prison in Polk County? Uh, and they're working on that. And these are University of Florida students. And, and they, are, they are dug in deep, uh, and, and they're going. But I would argue that probably some of those, you know, some of those people that want eight-year-old boys to be in prisons, regardless of their, their background, I would say that they, I mean, probably back in the 20s, they would have been clamped. Sorry, but that, it's so outrageous. But these, these students, um, they're, they're serious. They're, they're very good organizers use social media. They don't overuse social media. They don't do everything on Facebook, right? Uh, but they're really into that face-to-face -face organizing. And they have learned from uh, talking with people and following you know, lessons from people like Connie Canny, uh, Dan Harmeling, uh, Michael Gannon. I mean, they're, they're, sometimes we think they're not listening to us, our students, but they really are. You know, they, they may be doing this thing, Right? But they're still listening. They're doing really good work. Hey, thanks again, Dr. Ortiz. Um, I had a quick question just about the state of um, African American history in grade school education in Florida. I didn't go to school here, so I was wondering what is, what is the state now and what um, is being done to try to change it if there is anything being done? It, it's, it's not good overall. I mean, Cali Blunt can, can address this question. A lot, of, a lot of the locally and, and, and the state, a lot of the work that we do in the oral history program involves us going out, you know, we'll get a call from, from a, a, a hard press principal, we call the Florida Humanities Council, who says we, we, we really would like to teach black history, but none of our young teachers really know anything about it, and so can you come down and help? Um, and we do that as much as we can. I mean, people like, you know, Louise Newman, who are real active in, in, in doing, working with high school teachers, but we're outnumbered. Uh, we can't reach all of the districts that, that really need this, this work. And, and too often teachers are not getting supported by their districts or the state in teaching um, African American history. Um, I also get called out to, to do you know, curriculum workshops on like World War II, you know, the progressive era in other eras. So the state of history knowledge, um, when the freshmen come to, to their classes here, I mean, they often, we'll, we'll often ask them, it's like we're, we're kind of playing around the first day of class, you know, talk about your high school history curriculum. Did you find it to be stimulating? Different answers. But no, where we, part of it is that here at the University of Florida, I think we're, we're gonna, going to do a much better job in doing the, the educational service we need to be providing to the people of Florida. Um, African American Studies program does a heroic job now, um, but the proposal to become a department, and when that happens, that's gonna be a huge boon for school teachers in the state, because now you're creating a better capacity here to teach more people black history, you know, or different aspects of black but unless you build that capacity, it's very hard, and not just here, obviously, but UCF, USF. Cal, you've been working in, in, in Gainesville, certainly. I mean, what would be your assessment of?
Episodic, I see, yeah, I mean, that would be, yeah, I think it's a very, very charitable um, <laughs> characterization, right? It's very, because I, and I think, too, we need to get beyond, I mean, it's very important for young people to have role models, um, but it can't just be learn about Booker T. Washington, learn about Du Bois, you know, it, it's got to be a lot deeper. And, and now we have the ability to, to do that. Let me see, can I? Make my voice go through this thing. We're having problems hearing uh, some of the conversation because you're leaving. Oh, sorry. I was sorry. But I wanted to make a comment. When I moved to Gainesville in the 60s, you're talking about Klan country, we were surprised, having lived in New England all of our lives, to see a billboard outside of Acala saying, you are now entering Klan country. I mean, no kidding, there was this billboard. Also, there were other billboards that said, beautify America, get a haircut. That was the 60s, okay. Well, yeah, Klan people wearing um, their, their, their jackets at, and Joliet at the State Fair too, it's scary stuff. Um, I would like to ask everybody to take a moment to fill out your evaluation form. I think we've had a wonderful program here. Um, it, we might have time for one more question. And uh, I think that gentleman. It's kind of ironic. I'm from New England, and I remember years ago, I lived there in a town named Shelton, Connecticut, who had some of the biggest Klan activity. And a friend of mine was a truck driver, and when he went out to the truck depot, uh, I think in the late 70s, they were out there hitting leaflets. And sure enough, uh, one of the top Klansmen at the time lived in Shelton, Connecticut. And I never thought that would happen up our way, but it, it was there. Wait, is Shelton, is that near, like, uh, tobacco growing country, or no? Okay, it's... Okay, 